Welcome to the Oxygen Therapy in the Acute Setting narrated lecture. This lecture will cover what is oxygen therapy, when is oxygen therapy appropriate, the negative effects of oxygen therapy, complications of oxygen therapy, oxygen prescription, oxygen delivery and humidification. Oxygen therapy is a therapy that therapeutic administration of oxygen above what we breathe in the air at sea level. The aim is to increase the alveolar oxygen concentration. We refer to the percentage or the concentration of oxygen as the FiO2 or the fractional, fraction of inspired oxygen. This is either written as a percentage, so for example 21%, or as a decimal, so 0.21. Your tissues require oxygen to function and there is a balance between supply and demand. Oxygen consumption in the body varies with metabolic rate and an increase in oxygen consumption is usually met by an increase in the oxygen delivery. Your body normally does this by increasing your cardiac output, increasing your minute ventilation, that's calculated by your tidal volume times your respiratory rate, so how deep and fast you're breathing, and your body can also increase the rate at which oxygen is extracted from your tissues. There are clear guidelines for the use of oxygen in adults in the healthcare and emergency setting. These are published by the British Thoracic Society, most recently in 2017. You will find a copy of these on the Oxygen Therapy GCU, Le GCU Learn site or by googling BTS Oxygen Guidelines. It is used to treat or prevent the symptoms of hypoxemia, that is when the PO2 is less than 8 and to prevent tissue hypoxia, that is, where there's not enough oxygen to meet the metab metabolic demand, which in turn leads to tissue injury or cell death. Oxygen is treatment for hypoxemia and not for breathlessness. This is a common misconception, particularly amongst patients who may ask for oxygen purely because they feel short of breath. Patients with sepsis, shock and burns require extra oxygen due to the increased metabolic demand. So patients with sepsis can require 50 to 60 percent more oxygen due to, due to this increased metabolic demand. Patients may also have oxygen post-surgery due to the effects of the anaesthesia. Oxygen is a drug and should be prescribed. It does have side effects if it's not used appropriately and it should be prescribed in line with the British Thoracic Society guidelines. We are going to look at three serious complications, these being oxygen toxicity, absorption at atelectasis and loss of hypoxic drive with regards to patients with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Oxygen toxicity. If a patient received high concentra concentrations of oxygen, that is greater than 70%, for more than 28 hours, the patient is at risk of oxidative stress to the lung tissue. This can cause an inflammatory response. This in turn impairs the action of the cilia, microphages and surfactants within the lungs and the patient may experience substernal pain, cough and dyspnea. Interstitial edema may develop, lung compliance will decrease and the patient may eventually develop pulmonary fibrosis. Our alveoli are supported by the presence of nitrogen. This helps to keep them inflated. Absorption atelectasis may occur if excess oxygen fills the alveoli, forcing out the remaining nitrogen, and then the alveoli are at risk of collapse. This tends to happen in patients who are mechanically ventilated and who are receiving more than 70% oxygen for more than 48 hours. Hypoxic drive is a much debated theory and there's conflicting research about why it happens. However, clinically it is important to understand. Hypoxic drive refers to the change in breathing regulations in patients with chronic, res chronic respiratory conditions such as COPD. These patients require careful monitoring when given oxygen as their oxygen saturations will appear lower than the general populations. If we increase their oxygen, they can lose their drive to breathe and the respiratory rate will drop, putting them at risk of hypoxia. The reason for this is, our breathing is monitored by chemoreceptors, which monitor the carbon dioxide and oxygen in our blood. There are central chemoreceptors, which are found in the medulla, 
and peripheral chemoreceptors which are found in the carotid arteries. The central chemoreceptors are sensitive to carbon dioxide. The peripheral chemoreceptors are more sensitive to the oxygen level. Our primary feedback for ventilation is the change in carbon dioxide at the central chemoreceptors. This provides our bodies with feedback with regard to how much we require to ventilate. If the carbon dioxide levels increase, our respiratory rate will increase to breathe off the excess carbon dioxide. If our carbon dioxide levels drop, our respiratory rate will lower to try and retain carbon dioxide. Due to the disease process of COPD, these patients have chronically high levels of carbon dioxide and lower acceptable levels of oxygen in their arterial blood. Due to this change in blood composition, the chemoreceptors adapt and they become more reliant on the peripheral receptors to monitor their breathing. Therefore, their breathing is controlled by the levels of oxygen in their blood and not by the levels of carbon dioxide. If a patient with COPD has chronic hypercapnia, so type 2 respiratory failure, if they're given too much oxygen, there is a risk that the drive to breathe becomes less, the respiratory rate will fall. This needs careful monitoring and this is why patients with chronic COPD have target saturations of between 88 and 90% and 92%. You may hear these patients referred to as CO2 retainers. If a patient with COPD who becomes drowsy and appears to fall asleep after commencing oxygen therapy or having the flow rate changed, this needs to be managed immediately by removing the supplemental oxygen and alerting the medical staff as a matter of urgency. Complications of oxygen therapy. Patients report experiencing dry nose and mouth and eye irritation. Oxygen is also a fire hazard as it enhances the combustion of fuels. Patients should never smoke near to oxygen or shortly after removing their oxygen. There's also a risk of bacterial con contamination with humidification. Oxygen is a drug and should be prescribed to meet target saturations. These target saturations should be 94 to 98% in the general population and for patients at risk of type 2 respiratory failure, so those with chronic COPD, these should be 88 to 92% but this should be clearly documented in the notes and the patient may carry an alert card. In the acute setting, oxygen should be delivered continuously unless hypoxia is only under certain circumstances, for example, sleeping or exercise. If you were to go and see a patient and they were wearing oxygen in bed, this needs to be kept on if you were going to get them up. We discuss oxygen as the flow rate, so how many litres per minute they receive, or the concentration or the fraction of inspired oxygen. This is the FiO2. In the documentation, we tend to, tend to note down the delivery device, the concentration and the flow rate. We also may take note of the target saturations if they're at risk of type 2 respiratory failure. Oxygen is delivered from an oxygen port in the wall or via a canister. It's delivered via oxygen tubing to the patient's device. The flow of oxygen is adjusted by turning the dial on the oxygen flow meter which is pictured here. Oxygen should be administered by staff who are trained in oxygen administration. These staff should use appropriate devices and flow rates in order to achieve the target saturations. Staff should be trained to use a range of different oxygen delivery devices to ensure oxygen is delivered safe, safely. Oxygen delivery can be low flow, so of a variable performance, or high flow, so a fixed performance, so we know exactly how much oxygen a patient is receiving. The devices we are going to look at are low flow, so simple face mask, nasal cannula and a non rebreather mask, and high flow, a venturi mask and a high flow nasal oxygen. The simple face mask is a low cost product commonly seen on the ward. It delivers variable oxygen concentrations between approximately 40 and 60%. The oxygen supplied to the patient will be of a variable concentration depending on the flow of oxygen and the patient's breathing pattern. 
The concentration can be changed by increasing or decreasing the oxygen flow between 5 and 10 litres per minute. The flow must be at least 5 litres a minute to avoid carbon dioxide buildup. However, packaging still may say 10 to 10, 2 to 10 litres is acceptable. This is due to insufficient flow generated to clear the exhaled carbon dioxide from the mask. The patient may end up rebreathing the carbon dioxide. This mask is suitable for patients with respiratory failure without hypercapnia. So that's your patients with type 1 respiratory failure. It is not suitable for patients with hyper, who are hypercapnic who have type 2 respiratory failure. This is due to the risk of rebreathing the carbon dioxide. As it is available, depending on the patient's breathing rate, the exact concentration the patient receives is not known. Therefore, we document the flow rate of oxygen they're receiving. So in your documentation, you may write that your patient is on 5 litres of oxygen via face mask. Nasal cannula, also known as nasal cannulae or nasal prongs. The oxygen is delivered directly into the nose. Therefore, no humidification is required as the oxygen is humidified by the nasal system. The FiO2, or the concentration that the patient receives, is not accurate. This is due to the way that the patient breathes. This will affect the amount of oxygen that they receive. Therefore, in the notes, we document as litres and not the concentration of oxygen. If they have a high respiratory rate, the Fi2 they receive will be higher. If they breathe through their mouth, it is also less accurate. However, there is, is still oxygen that will reach the patient as it pulls in the larynx. Some patients may experience discomfort and nasal dryness at flows greater than 4 litres per minute. Therefore, this tends to be used to provide oxygen at 1 litre to 4 litres per minute. It does have certain advantages over a face mask. It's more comfortable and they're able to drink. They're also able to talk more easily. There are disadvantages as it may cause na nasal irritation or soreness and does not always work if the, nears if the nose is congested or blocked. In the documentation, as we do not know the exact concentration being provided to the patient, we also document as litres. So we would write that the patient is on 2 litres of oxygen via nasal cannula. Nasal high flow is a heated and humidified system. It's able to, to provide an FiO2 of 20 to 60% to our patients. We are able to provide a higher fraction of inspired oxygen and it also provides some positive pressure. It is more comfortable than face masks of the same flow rate, therefore is tolerated better by patients. However, it is far more expensive and is not available at every site. Non-rebreather or trauma mask. This is used in emergency situations only and only for a short period of time. It delivers high flow oxygen. Before we put the mask on the patient, we allow the bag to fill with oxygen. When the patient breathes out, oxygen fills the bag and the oxygen is breathed in on inhalation. It only works for flows of greater than 10 litres as you do not want the patient to retain carbon dioxide. However, it is usually used for 15 litres of oxygen. This is approximately 85% oxygen. It is non-humidified and is very drying. In the documentation, the flow is documented, so we would write that the patient is on 15 litres of oxygen via a non-breather or by trauma mask. A venturi mask will give an accurate concentration of oxygen to the patient regardless of oxygen flow. The minimum suggested flow rate is written on each venturi device. Venturi masks are available in the following concentrations 24, 28, 31, 35, 40 and 60. They are suitable for all patients who need a known concentration of oxygen. However, 
24 and 28 percent Venturi masks are particularly suited for those at risk of carbon dioxide retention. They work by carrying the oxygen through the narrow tubing. When they reach the valve, some room air is entrained through the port. This process determines the specific oxygen concentration that is delivered. The masks have holes at the side that provide an escape route for the ex exhaled air and decreases the chance of rebreathing carbon dioxide compared to a normal face mask. This mask cannot be humidified. Each percentage mask has a different colour of valve to represent the percentage of O2 delivered. You will see this on the next slide. In the documentation, we document the, the FiO2. So you would write that the patient is on 24% FiO2 ve via Venturi mask. You may also document the flow rate. The upper airway normally warms, moistens and filters inspired gases. When these functions are impaired by a pathological process or bypassed by an artificial airway, it is common practice to provide humi humidification. The main reason for using humidification, especially with high flow oxygen, is that it may reduce the sensation of dryness in the upper airways that oxygen can cause. The evidence for this, however, is poor. However, the British Thoracic Society guidelines say that the use of humidified oxygen in the acute care is based on expert opinion. As physios, we may, we may recommend humidification for patient comfort and also to help with th thick, sticky secretions. In summary, oxygen is used to treat or prevent the symptoms of hypoxemia. Oxygen is a drug and needs to be prescribed in order to meet target saturations. Oxygen should not be changed without speaking to the medical staff. Caution needs to be given when treating patients with chronic hypercapnia and giving them increased levels of oxygen due to the risk of loss of hypoxic drive. <laughs>